This episode picks up right where the drama left off. Tony and Joan are officially not friends anymore. Why? Just a minor issue where Tony spilled Joan's tea to her boss about Sean's little addiction problem. Joan, of course, didn't find this out through Tony, but through her boss. And how did that happen? Well, Joan innocently checked in with him about his progress on finding a house after referring Tony to him as a realtor. Instead of chatting about listings, she gets served with that bombshell, leaving her completely humiliated and ready to end things with Tony for good. And to make matters worse for Tony, she gets fired from her job the very same day. Because when it rains, it pours, right? Tony tries to act like losing her job isn't a big deal in front of her crew, but the minute Maya and Lynn peace out, she totally crumbles, crawling over to a frosty Joan who's so done with Tony's problems. Joan is in full couldn't care less mode, calmly gathering Tony's things, shoving them in a box, and telling her to hit the road. Meanwhile, Tony is in full on begging and pleading, desperate to fix their friendship, even offering to go back to therapy, again. But Joan? She's hit her breaking point too, telling Tony that she used to believe her I didn't mean to hurt you routine, but now realizes Tony just doesn't wish her well. Oh, and let's not forget this all comes hot on the heels of them patching things up after Tony tried to sleep with Sean to get back at Joan, who, by the way, accidentally spilled the beans to Tony's boyfriend, Greg, that she accepted another man's proposal. And just when you think it couldn't get any messier, Tony went full attack mode on Joan during a girl's trip to Jamaica, right after Joan owned up to spilling the truth to Greg. It's a wonder these two can even look at each other anymore. Joan wastes no time dropping the bomb on her friends, but reassures them that she won't make them choose sides. She even encourages them to stick by Tony, though she's over it. In one last ditch effort to patch things up, Tony shows up at Joan's office to return her house keys. Joan, in full ice cream mode, tells her to hand them off to Maya. But of course, Maya's not around, so Joan, clearly not interested, tells her to just leave the keys on her desk. As Tony heads out, she can't resist one final attempt, asking if Joan was really going to toss 20 years of friendship in the trash. Joan doesn't even flinch, leaving Tony to throw out an ultimatum of her own. If Joan wouldn't talk, she'd cut her off. Spoiler alert, Joan couldn't care less. But in true Joan fashion, we get a moment of vulnerability in the final scene where she breaks down crying to William after realizing her usual Pilates plans with Tony were a thing of the past. That's when it hits her. She's really mourning the end of this friendship, wrestling with disappointment and a whole lot of resentment. After the Joan drama, Tony's trying to carry on with life, clinging to Lynn, Maya, and William as her emotional support squad. During a lunch with the ladies, she spots her ex, Greg, lurking nearby. Tony wonders if Greg sees her, and in the most awkward move ever, he responds from right behind her. They have a polite, if not painfully stiff exchange, but let's be real. Tony can't stop wishing Greg would look at her the way she's laser beaming him. When he finally leaves, she chases him down, throwing out a very official apology for her messiness. Greg, being the ice king he is, accepts but barely acknowledges her existence as he strolls away without so much as a see ya. Of course, the story isn't over. By the end of the episode, Greg randomly shows up at Tony's place to invite her to his art gallery opening because, surprise, most of the pieces are inspired by her. Flattered and maybe a bit confused, Tony agrees and when Greg asks to kiss her, Tony doesn't even wait. She dives in first because why waste time when you're Tony Childs, right? Jump cut to the beginning of this episode, the ladies, minus Joan, are having dinner while Tony drops the punchline to a joke about her and Greg because of course she is. As they're finishing up, Maya signals to Lynn that it's time to bounce and grab Jabari. Tony thanks them properly, but Maya gives a quick you're welcome as she and Lynn make a hasty exit. Not so fast though. Tony chases them down, all sentimental, thanking them for not taking sides in her little battle with Joan. Lynn gives her the old, we didn't befriend you just because of Joan, which seems to hit the spot for Tony, who's feeling all warm and fuzzy now. Maya shoots her off like, girl, bye, and Tony finally takes the hint. But then, plot twist, Joan shows up, apologizing for being late. 
Maya, feigning hanger, tells Joan to hurry up while Joan rushes off to the restroom, leaving Maya and Lynn awkwardly lurking. Of course, they bump into Tony again, because fate has jokes, and she's immediately questioning why they're still in the restaurant. Lynn, clearly over it, wants to know why Tony's still there, and Tony claims she left her magazine behind. Sure, Tony. Maya, quick on her feet, lies that they just came back in for a sip of water before scurrying off with Lynn in tow. Outside, Lynn's like, now what? And Maya, panicking, just yells, scatter. Over at Tony's place, Lynn is casually borrowing a wig while they chat about Halloween plans. Tony, ever the socialite, offers a double date night out on the town, but Lynn's like, nah, I'm heading to Joan's Halloween party. Lynn tries to smooth things over, offering to hang out after, but Tony's not here for the sloppy seconds life and says they'll catch up some other time. Lynn promises that the next holiday will be all hers. Thanksgiving? Tony asks, hopeful. Nah, girl, Lynn clarifies. Veterans Day, because Joan would literally kill me if I missed Thanksgiving. Priorities, right? Tony shrugs and sends Lynn off with a have fun. Later, Greg casually mentions Joan's annual Halloween bash, pointing out that it must suck for Tony to miss out. But Tony, not one to admit defeat, assures him that the party's a total dud without her. Greg, being the good boyfriend, agrees. But Tony has a mini meltdown like, but what if it is fun without me? Greg snaps her out of it, suggesting that they start a new tradition by carving pumpkins instead. He tells her to run to the store while he gets dinner ready, and Tony's all hard eyes saying, you're the only treat I need. Then Greg, ever the charmer, says if she hurries back, he'll be her trick. And suddenly, Tony's out the door like a shot. Hold up. Freeze. You see that? The only moment of foreshadowing we get. We don't know what Greg's plotting, but whatever it is, it's definitely giving diabolical vibes. Over at Joan's Halloween party, things are feeling a little off. Lynn admits she misses Tony and Maya while trying to stay loyal to Joan can't deny it either. After all, the holiday season without your friends is a nightmare. Enter William with a revelation. Lynn, thinking that she's onto something, asks if it's Tony he's missing. But William's like, nah, I just realized I'm the only guy here. Maya, ever observant, asks Joan if she noticed the sausage fest or lack thereof. Joan brushes it off, insisting more guys are on the way only to have a light bulb moment. Tony was the one who always invited the men. Without Tony, the man pool is dry. Lynn tries to help, suggesting they just call Tony up and bring the guys back, but Joan stands firm. No Tony, no men, and we're moving on. Meanwhile, over at Tony's place, she's excited about her new pumpkin snagging the biggest one for a steal at just $5. But her pumpkin joy is short-lived when she walks in to find Greg, oh yeah, half-dressed with another woman in her living room. And this chick has the audacity to thank Tony for letting them use her place. Greg, casually zipping up his pants, delivers the line of the century. Payback's a bitch. Tony, not one to be outdone, tries to run Greg over with her grocery cart because why not? But he's like, you can't hurt me anymore. Then he goes on this scathing monologue about how he loved her unconditionally while she belittled him, cheated, and nearly gave him an STD. He hits her with, did you really think I'd come running back to you like a fool? Well, who's the fool now? Tony's done and tells Greg to get out. And he's more than happy to bounce with his new girl in tow, giving Tony a smug happy Halloween as they leave. And just like that, Tony's left standing there, crying and alone. Back at Joan's party, Maya and Lynn are watching William, who's living his best life as a Halloween pimp, dancing with the ladies, thoroughly enjoying being the only guy in the room. Lynn, clearly a little tipsy, admits to Maya that she's feeling the urge to back it up on William. Maya, equally as messy, confesses she's feeling the same and suggests they both need some fresh air before they do something they'll regret. As they step outside, they stumble upon a desperate looking Tony sitting on the porch with her pumpkin and grocery cart still by her side. Lynn, always trying to be nice, asks if Tony's okay, but Maya's like, um, obviously not. Inside, Joan is clueless and asks William where Maya and Lynn disappeared to, but he's no help. 
Then Maya rushes in, spilling the tea that Tony's outside, but Joan is not happy to hear that. Maya insists Joan should go and see her anyway, and Joan reluctantly agrees. When Joan finally faces Tony, her first reaction is to ask why she's there. Lynn, ever the peacemaker, explains that Greg set Tony up for some revenge drama. Tony, looking defeated, tells Joan that even though they're not friends anymore, she had nowhere else to go. Maya tries to convince Joan to let Tony inside and pull herself together, but Joan coldly suggests that Tony would be better off at Maya's place instead. Mm. The next day at work, William brings up the Tony situation to Joan, trying to tread lightly. He suggests that Joan was a little harsh on Tony, but Joan isn't having it. She crosses her arms and reminds him that he was one of the people telling her to cut Tony out of her life in the first place. So what's up with the sudden change of heart? William, backpedaling, clarifies that he didn't mean Joan should kick Tony while she's already down. It's just a bit too cold-hearted, even for him, and it's bringing up his own trauma from being bullied. Lynn and Maya burst in, cutting off William's pity party. Lynn, totally confused, asks what he's even talking about, while Maya shuts it down with the classic, this is why I don't send a man to do a woman's job. William, never one to miss a chance to stir the pot, tells the ladies that they're all acting schizo and that the real issue between Joan and Tony is buried sexual tension. Joan naturally dismisses this nonsense, but William keeps going, claiming that real friends don't obsess over each other or need therapy. They just give each other a pat on the back and move on. According to William, Joan and Tony secretly want each other and he suggests that they just act on their so-called hidden desires. But of course, that's the solution, right? Meanwhile, Tony is dealing with a crisis of her own. Retail therapy gone wrong. While browsing at a boutique, her credit card gets embarrassingly declined. She tries one after the other, even going so far as to offer her Kaiser prescription card as payment. Points for creativity, I guess. But no luck, all declined. Instead of bowing out gracefully, Tony starts grabbing more stuff she clearly can't afford, adding it to the growing pile at the counter. Taz, the poor cashier, watches this train wreck unfold and decides to take action. He grabs her contact book and starts calling anyone who might care enough to come and rescue her. One by one, though, everyone he calls hangs up on him. Apparently, Tony's burned more bridges than she thought. Just as Taz is getting through the list, Tony reappears half wearing a pair of jeans she's trying to convince herself and him that she looks amazing in. Taz, in a moment of brutal honesty, disguised as kindness, tells her to hold on to her beauty because that's all she's got. She doesn't have a single friend left. Tony, ever oblivious, replies that she also doesn't have any belts and that a girl can't have too many. In the next scene, Maya and Lynn roll up to save Tony from her own dramatic collapse, and Taz, the ever-patient cashier, points them in her direction, casually noting that Tony's pulled a full-on girl interrupted. They find Tony in true diva fashion laid out on the couch, clutching a pile of clothes like they were her last lifeline. Maya, not here for the theatrics, hits her with some tough love, telling her to get up and go home already. Tony, in peak melodrama, announces that she's heading back to Fresno, ready to live the farm life with her parents. Lynn quickly reminds her that she's always described Fresno as the personal version of hell. But Tony, committed to her pity party, says she'd rather be in hell than LA because, according to her, she's got nothing left. No job, no man, no best friend, no money. She's ready for her mom to fatten her up and her dad to put her to work on the farm. Maya and Lynn are fully over it, doubling down on the tough love. They tell her to stop running from her problems and face the consequences of her actions. Lynn, not mincing words, reminds her that she's the one who lost Greg, not Joan, and that she's also the one who blew it with Joan. Tony, still fishing for sympathy, asks if it was also her fault that she lost her job and her money. Maya, not missing a beat, says, yep, those chickens she let loose, they've come home to roost. Tony, hilariously missing the point, says her mom has chickens and Lynn's pretty sure they've lost her again. But Maya, not falling for it, says Tony's not lost. She's just pretending to be, running her usual game. And guess what? Game over. 
Maya tells Lynn that they're leaving and Tony, in her most vulnerable moment yet, says that she doesn't want to lose them too. Maya lays down the final ultimatum. If that's true, she better get her butt up and leave with them. And finally, Tony gives in. The next day, the crew heads to church and naturally they drag Tony along. Joan's already there full of smiles until she sees Tony walk in and just like that, her joy evaporates. Joan turns to Maya, wondering if she can at least have church time Tony free, but Maya's not here for it and tells her that the place isn't called St. Joan. Tony approaches Joan with a heartfelt apology, owning up to all her bad decisions and taking full accountability. She lays it all out, admitting that she doesn't deserve Joan, but desperately wants to make things right. Joan, recognizing how hard that was for Tony, thanks her, but she's already made up her mind. She tells Tony that she just can't go there with her again and moves to a different pew. Classic Joan, always leaving with the final word. The girls, not surprised by Joan's ironclad boundaries, shrug it off and turn their attention to Donnie McClurkin belting out, we fall down. Lynn, ever the supportive friend, nudges Tony and tells her she did well in making peace with Joan, even if Joan's acting like Fort Knox. Mid-song, Donnie McClurkin pauses to drop a little biblical wisdom on the congregation, reminding them that even a just man can fall seven times. The catch? The church might write him off as wicked after the seventh stumble, because sure, we're all about grace for the first or second time, but after seven? Nope, you're canceled. But then Donnie flips the script, saying what makes the man just is his ability to get back up and straighten out. So no matter how many times you've messed up, God's love and mercy are always there to pull you back in. Cue Tony getting all in her feelings, soaking in that divine pep talk. As Donnie keeps preaching about forgiveness, Tony's hit by the weight of it all, especially when she sees a man step up for confession. The emotions build, and before long, Tony is up on her feet, heading for the altar like it's the only place to be. Joan, of course, can't keep her cool any longer. Tears start flowing like someone just turned on a faucet. Next thing you know, Joan's walking up to the altar, grabbing Tony's hand, and the two have a tearful moment, finally letting bygones be bygones. Looks like Joan's boundary walls just came crashing down, and the friendship is back on track. Tony Childs, the queen of self-absorption in designer heels, really thought she could finesse Joan forever. Like, Sis genuinely believed that she could just keep burning all those bridges and Joan would just still be standing there, holding a white flag ready to sweep up her mess. But let's get real for a sec. No friendship, no matter how long, is bulletproof. This episode hits hard because it's the moment Joan finally says, enough. Tony's been running the same tired playbook for years. Gaslighting, betrayal, manipulation. But this time, Sis overplayed her hand by dragging Joan's personal business into it, and Joan wasn't having it. It wasn't about some guy. It was about the blatant disrespect for Joan as her so-called BFF. Joan has always been Tony's safety net. The one cleaning up her messes, forgiving her, being the rock. But even the strongest rocks wear down. And Tony... Well, she thought she could just waltz back in like always, throw on some crocodile tears and Joan would fold. But not this time. This time, Joan's had enough. And let me tell you, when someone's done, that silence, that icy cold shoulder, louder than any shouting match. Now, Tony, she definitely needed this wake up call. She'd been living in this delusion where Joan was just there to clean up her mess. But this time, Tony was left sitting in her own disaster. Sometimes losing that one person who's always had your back is life's biggest plot twist. And that's the thing with boundaries. They're a whole vibe. Joan's power move wasn't just in walking away, but in realizing her worth beyond being the fixer or the forgiver. She reclaimed her power by saying, no more. And here's the kicker. Forgiveness isn't about giving someone else a pass. It's about freeing yourself. Joan had every right to keep that door locked, but in that church surrounded by faith and history, she didn't just hear Tony's apology, she accepted it. Because real strength, it's in knowing that forgiveness isn't weakness, it's power. That doesn't mean everything's back to sunshine and rainbows, but it does mean Joan found her peace. So what's the takeaway? 
Be careful how you treat the people who've always had your back. And when it's time to forgive, do it for your own peace. Not because they've earned it, but because you have. If you vibe with this video, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. You know you want to. Drop a like and let me know in the comments what you thought about this episode. Spill the tea on your favorite moments and tell me what you want to see next. And if you're craving more of this kind of content, check out one of these videos right here.